bones. They're enriched in like bones and teeth, right? Which of course, you know, if you're a bacterium, it's not going to do you much good to eat those, right? Um, they do not accumulate these energy-rich things which happen to be rather bad for our health in old age. So, that could be rather interesting. It could be that that's because they've got microbes in graveyards and so on that break down this sort of stuff, and uh, that might be useful. Not in the sense that we might inject those bacteria into our bodies and um, thereby get rid of the stuff. I think that would probably be counterproductive. Um, but, um, but rather that we can figure out the genetic basis for that capacity, how they're breaking down these things, and then we might find just a couple of genes that encode important enzymes that are involved in this process, and we can maybe incorporate those genes using whatever technique, maybe um, enzyme therapy, maybe gene therapy, um, into our own cells, so as to augment our natural catabolic machinery, and thereby get rid of these substances that are accumulating so catastrophically in these important diseases. So the idea of graphically is simply this, that there's this process in the human body that turns young people into old people, and eventually into dead people. And then there's this completely different process that turns dead people into decomposed people. And that's a process that's encoded in the microbial ecology, and so we just do some tedious but pretty normal molecular biology and figure out how they're doing it, and then we um, uh, uh, apply that information to our own, our own cells, this is my absolutely appalling cartoon of a neuron, and, um, uh, and, and then um, uh, obviously thereby combat the initial process that turned young people into old people in the first place. Now, sure enough, this works. Just as it does in environmental decontamination, it works here. This is a diagram from the first paper that was published by um, a group funded by my foundation, actually, a couple of years ago. And what we've got here is an attempt to get rid of this stuff, which is probably public enemy number one in atherosclerosis. There's a whole bunch of oxidation derivatives of cholesterol that have been detected in atherosclerotic plaques and in foam cells and so on. But this one is one of the most abundant and also one of the most toxic, 7-keto cholesterol. So here we have seven different strains trying to be um, trying to have a go at this stuff. Um, five of them can't do anything with it whatsoever, so they're just sitting there like lemons, and so is the 7-KC. But two of them are having a great time, and after only 10 days, the stuff's completely gone. You don't even need a microscope to see it. So that's all very good news indeed. Um, what do you do next? Well, of course, as I mentioned, we don't want to just put the bacteria into the body. We've got to figure out the genetic basis. So there's various ways to go about that. One important approach is mass spectrometry, whereby we can identify the breakdown products that the microbes are generating as a result of metabolizing this stuff. And thereby, we can infer the, uh, the, the enzymatic reactions that are occurring, and obviously then use um, various homology-based arguments to identify the relevant gene. And that's going pretty well, too. We're really quite good at both of those steps at this point. But of course, that's only the beginning. I am obviously not going to try to convince you that this is easy, this other approach. This is really, really hard, really long-term, no question. We are pretty good at steps one and two. We're um, earnestly beavering away at step three at the moment, modifying these uh, genes so that they get appropriately glycosylated for targeting to the lysosome so that they get to the right place and work, work appropriately. We've got to make sure that they don't break down things that we'd rather they didn't break down. There are plenty of tricks for making that happen, but we've got to actually do that work. Uh, we've got to make sure that they still actually function against the desired substrate, which may not occur because of differences in pH, for example. Then after we've got all that nice and sorted, we've got to move into the in vivo context and work with mice. And it's only after all of this is working nicely in mice that we can even think about clinical trials. So it's going to be a very long time before all of this is working. But I don't think I need to persuade you folks that that's not a reason not to work on this because all of you know that the treatments that we have for these utterly, extraordinarily debilitating and prevalent diseases of old age at the moment are pathetically impotent. They really hardly work at all. And that is also true of pretty much everything that's coming down the pipe. We may be able to mildly slow down and postpone the development and progression of these diseases, but only mildly, and that's how it's going to stay, until we have some way to go for the jugular, to actually attack these diseases at their root, which means the accumulating molecular garbage that causes them in the first place. So when this works, however long it takes, it's going to completely transform and defeat these diseases. And that means that we'd better get on with it, because the sooner we start, the sooner we'll finish. All right, so that's the, um, that's the hardcore biology of the talk. And what I'm going to do now in the, next, in the last 10 minutes or so is talk about what's going to happen next. Because so far, I haven't told you how to defeat aging. Um, I often give it, often I use, for the title of my talk, I use the phrase, prospects for defeating aging altogether. And that's a pretty strong statement, um, because it would mean, you know, having a, an equivalent degree of medical control over aging that we currently have over most infectious diseases, for example. And I'm not claiming that these approaches will do that. I'm claiming that these approaches, to the extent that we can implement them with high probability in the next 20 or 30 years, um, might achieve this much. We might be able to take um, people who are already in middle age, 
not um, exhibiting significant pathology yet, but getting close to that, and give them an additional 30 years of healthy life. Okay, so that they take maybe, um, maybe they're 60 years old, and they don't get to be biologically 60 again until they're chronologically 90, that sort of thing. That's all I'm planning that these things are going to be able to achieve. So what's the catch? Why do I talk about defeating aging altogether? Well, it's basically because of the third reason why the maintenance approach is so cool. I've told you that it targets the weak link between, um, between metabolism and pathology. I've told you that damage is not simply the weakest link, it's also the simplest. But this one is the big one. Repairing damage buys time. That 30 years that I just mentioned, between someone coming in for their first rejuvenation therapy and needing a second one, that's one hell of a long time in technology, including, of course, biomedical technology. And that means something rather profound, which I'm going to try to communicate using this absolutely horrible schematic diagram. Um, um, so please don't try to take anything quantitative away from this. I'm just trying to get a point across here. Um, what I'm uh, trying to communicate here is the difficulty with what I've said so far and the reasons why we can actually be much more optimistic. So on the x-axis, obviously, I've got age. On the y-axis, I've got damage. I'm using the word reserve. That's not, the, not a new concept I'm introducing here. It's just the reciprocal of damage. It's the amount of additional damage that you can afford to accumulate before things start going wrong. So obviously, at age zero, you start off with um, uh, not much damage, well, not very much damage, and um, uh, a lot of reserve, and you gradually accumulate more and more damage and lose reserve, and eventually you get down to this point, what I'm calling the frailty threshold, where pathology starts to, start to occur, and after that, there's not a lot that you folks can do for these people. Um, so far. Uh, now, if we look at what I've said in the talk so far, we're looking at what's depicted by the pink line. You, first of all, take someone who's already in middle age, you have some therapies that are reasonably effective, though not completely effective, against all of these various types of damage. And so that's what this pink line um, achieves. It basically repairs, let's say, half the damage, the easy damage. Um, then, of course, we're not trying, we're not proposing to alter the rate at which damage is created. So that's why the pink line after that is at the same slope as the red line. But then we can apply the therapy repeatedly. We can apply it the third time and so on. The problem, of course, is diminishing returns. We get less and less benefit each time we apply the therapy. And the reason for that is very easy to see in this diagram, namely that the difficult damage that the therapy doesn't work on is continuing to accumulate unabated such that eventually, on its own, however well you're fixing the easy damage, the difficult damage is going to push our hero over the frailty threshold, and that's why we only get, let's say, 30 years of additional life. So now, however, we should, we could also use this diagram to look at the consequences we could expect if we take into account the improvements of technology that happen over time. Because, of course, this interval here, maybe it's not 30 years, but it's probably, 10, it's probably 15 or 20 years between the first and second applications of the rejuvenation therapy for the particular individual. And so what I've uh, done here with this orange line is to depict the idea that not only will these therapies obviously fix the same types of damage that were able to be fixed 15 or 20 years previously, they will also fix some proportion, let's say for sake of argument, half of the damage that could not be fixed previously. And that has this effect. And of course the key point here is that this rejuvenates the individual not simply more effectively than they would have been rejuvenated with the old therapies, but actually more effectively than they were rejuvenated 20 years previously with the old therapies, even though they were 20 years younger chronologically at that point. And of course, if we iterate on that general concept, then this is what we get. We get a profoundly different outcome in the long term than what we get if we don't incorporate the concept of improving technology. In other words, over the long term, these people are going to get biologically younger as they get chronologically older, and they never, however long they live, get anywhere near the frailty threshold. They stay genuinely biologically useful as long as they live. But that's why we can talk realistically about the concept of defeating aging altogether. Even though these therapies are never perfect, they have the functional outcome of that's equivalent to having been absolutely 100% perfect right from the beginning. All right, so that's such a profound concept that I thought I would give a name to it. What I'm actually giving a name to is the cusp. So obviously there's a minimum rate of technological progress that's required here to actually go in the long term upwards rather than downwards. Uh, a minimum rate at which the comprehensiveness of the therapies needs to be improved. That's what I call longevity escape velocity. The rate at which these rejuvenation therapies need to be improved in comprehensiveness, following that first step, the achievement of what I call robust human rejuvenation, those first 30 years, in order to stay one step ahead of the problem, to outpace the accumulation of damage that the therapies don't yet work on. 
complicated concept in words, but very simple in, uh, in the concept that I've shown you in the diagram. So then, of course, the fundamental question we have to ask ourselves is, well, okay, how realistic is it that we could actually achieve longevity escape velocity? And um, I would like to put a couple of arguments to you for suggesting that it's actually very likely indeed. 